Well, everyone, we are at the final chapter 21 and 22, Revelation. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. There's a lot to rejoice about. I have been off of chemo now for 30 days. They looked at my x-rays from, and compared it to August, the cancer has not grown. It has not moved. And so they gave me another 30 days off of chemo. So, uh, but the bad news is because of the evaluation, I am not a recipient of chemo anymore. The lungs are so damaged that that's what's causing me to have pneumonia. So they're gonna come up with one more new plan and he said he'll share that with us in January and we'll go from there. So ever since then, I've been able to walk a lot more except long distances. I still can't do the building. Uh, uh, grocery stores and Walmart, it's a little bit too long. But now I'm able to walk around the house without the walker. And so those last 10 days have been super exciting. And uh, so wanted to share that with you. And uh, so uh, I just finished the Bible study uh, of what we're going to start in January. On the 7th of January, we begin again in this room. And so Sundays and Thursdays, we'll be talking about the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. And, there, and then we're going to compare the scriptures. You have no idea how many extra teachings they have that is not biblical. And, uh, for example, they have uh, seven sacraments instead of two. Priests cannot marry. Uh, they can now eat meat on Friday. They don't follow that rule anymore. Uh, also, purgatory is still a primary teaching of that church. And actually, I found out that it's a moneymaker. And so when they pray for their loved ones that are dead, which we don't do because they're already gone. And so uh, they have a little coin box. And then marriage annulments, they pay money for that. And uh, I'm thinking, whoa, what's going on? And so there's so many things that I've learned over the years, and I interviewed several Catholic priests over the last 45 years. So I'm going to share with you some of the things that they've said. But how many of you ever uh, talked with a, uh, uh, a nun or a priest where he where they say, the Holy Father said, dot, dot, dot. The Holy Father said, dot, dot, dot. Do you know what that means? I always thought they meant the Heavenly Father. That's not what that means. They say the Holy Father is either the Pope or Cardinal or Bishop. And they still call their priest Father. And the Apostle Paul specifically said, don't call them Father. Because you only have one father, and that's the Heavenly Father. So we're going to see a lot of scriptures, and uh, so I'm going to take the main teachings of the Catholic Church based upon the interviews that I've had with many of the priests over the years. And uh, I can tell you one priest is now a Lutheran pastor. That's not because of me, but I think it's because of the Holy Spirit. So I was kind of laughing at him, and he said, you see how much you missed? And, and he says, no, I haven't missed a thing. I'm still in ministry. <laughs> so we're going to begin with prayer Heavenly Father come before you we're so excited we are now at the last two chapters of Revelation help us to get excited about your word and help us to see how the closing of Genesis and the opening of Revelation comes to us through Jesus Christ our Lord and all God's people say Amen so right out of the shoot I want to read some verses from chapter 21 of Revelation and then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. Okay, so this is after Judgment Day. So now we're seeing what's happening after Judgment Day. And there was no longer any sea. I thought that was interesting. So we'll no longer, matter of fact, it's a brand new world. But we're not going to have oceans to divide us. One of the teachings of the theologians said that the oceans came from the flood. So this is why today we're finding out people that are exploring ocean bottoms. There used to be valleys and they're finding things that's proven that there used to be people to where there's now water. And so it's believed that the flood has altered 
In fact, uh, some believe that Africa and the United States, if you put them together, they almost fit on their shoreline. So there's a little bit of, so it's kind of interesting to hear what science says about that. And I saw the holy city. Notice what it's called, the New Jerusalem. So we're going to have a new Jerusalem, a new city coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride. There's your church right there. Beautifully dressed uh, for her husband. The groom is Christ. And I uh, heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them in their by their God. And remember God's name, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Very good. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. You will have no... Can you imagine going through eternity with no problems? No headaches, no migraines, and, uh, you know, but notice what it starts to say in verse 5. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost for every spring of the water of life. Who's that? Jesus. But in my Bible, it's not in red ink. I was going to call the company up. I said, you missed one. Because everything in my Bible that where Jesus is speaking, it's always in red. So I've always wondered, why is it that? But when he calls himself the elf, or is it the Heavenly Father? Mine is red. Huh? Mine is Yours is red. So you got the right print then. <laughs> yes, because, but... Has the Father and the Son said that they are the Alpha and the Omega? Yeah, they both have said that. So that's true for both of them. He who overcomes will inherit this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, now this is the only little bit of talks about unbelievers, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, well, that leaves me out. I mean, how many of you tell, tell a fib once in a while? And you lie to stretch the truth a little bit. How, how, why are you cowering? Yeah, we, we, we all lie. But we repent of that regularly. And so their place will be with the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Second death means eternal death in hell. That's what the second death. Christians will never experience the second death. They only experience one. Then in verse 9, one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls full of the seven last plague came and said to me, come and I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of from heaven. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of the very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gate. And the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, 12 times 12, 144,000. We were, uh, the, uh, there were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 fountain, uh, foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So we have a very, very specific, this chapter explains everything that's being said. So we don't have to wonder, well, what does this mean? Verse 15, the angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the laid out the, like a square as long as it's wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it 12,000 stadias in length and it was as wide and as high as it is long. 
He measured its walls and it was 144 cubits thick by the man's measurement, which the angels was using. And the wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold and pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth uh, sardinax, whatever that is, the sixth carnelian, and the seventh uh, chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth uh, chrysoprast, the that Say that three times real fast. The eleventh Johnson, the twelfth Ephesus, and the twelve gates were the twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. Ooh, that's a big pearl. The great street of the city was pure as gold like transparent glass. See how beautiful heaven is going to be. And then I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God and the Lamb are its temple. You see? how scripture interprets scripture. And so the city does not need the sun or the moon or shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light and the lamb its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor to it. No one day, uh, no, uh, and on no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and the honor of the nations we brought into it Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So as you look at your first outline, that one-page outline about the paradise to come, notice that uh, the New Jerusalem, so and it's coming from heaven, and it's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is another way to put that. All Christians from the time of Adam and Eve till the, the Lord comes, are going to gather together. And it's the ideal church. It's the only perfect church you could ever find. See, here at uh, Our Savior, we only have uh, two families that are Christian. We got Bill Sr. and Bill Jr. But anyway, no. <laughs> you got a great last name, I'll tell you. And it's a shadow of what is to come, so... John is giving to us a quick snapshot of what heaven's going to look like. And I wanted to, you to take a look at the word new. New Jerusalem. A new heaven. A new earth. The word new is kainan, which means it's renewed or rejuvenated. That's what that means. And so I wanted you to know what that Greek word was. And, uh, and then it's not neos. That's another word new. So, but the specifically, the other one is what it means. And then we heard about astadia. Astadia. How long is that? So I had to look it up. I had to re-figure what astadia is. It's 1,380 miles. One thousand three hundred and eighty miles is twelve thousand stadiums. And then I also mentioned the word cubic. A hundred the walls are hundred and forty-four cubics. Now, according to a, a, a cubic, it varies between seventeen to twenty inches. Because a carpenter used to measure from the, his elbow to the tip of his finger. That's a cubic. So the cubic, 144 cubics. The walls were 216 feet thick. That's two thirds of a football field. Wow, pretty large. Yes. And the city, as it was described, is luminary. You could see through it. That's how pure heaven is. And then it mentions twice there's no need for a sun, moon, or stars. We have its own light. And we're going to talk about that when we do the outline a little bit later. And uh, 
that throughout this, we have this open fellowship with God. The doors are going to be left open. So when Jesus talks about the, the ten virgins, five were wise, and five were, the doors were closed. And so that's going to happen on Judgment Day, but then after Judgment Day, the doors will remain open. Nobody else is coming in, but there's no reason to shut the door anymore. Because all the evil, the wicked, the sinners, the unrepentant, that is, unrepentant sinners, they are cast out permanently. The door will never be open to them. And so we have that description of chapter 21. Chapter 22. This gets into a fun place. This is where Revelation is suddenly going to go whoosh. You're finally going to see what, Re what Genesis said and then what Revelation says in response to Genesis. So in the final chapter, then the angel showed me the river of water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down to the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, each side, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. It's describing the function of the tree of life. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on his foreheads, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. He said it again. They will not need a light of the lamp or a light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. And the angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angels to show his servants the things that must soon take place. And then we see the coming of Jesus. How many of you have your Bible where it's marked the coming of Jesus? Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of prophecy in his book. So now we're going back to where John's being inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this and says, don't forget to tell the people I'm coming to. And so he's quoting from Jesus. And I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, do not do it. Why not? I am fellow servant with you and with your brothers and the prophets and of all who keep the words of this book, worship God. Then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. So in other words, don't close it. Leave it open. Tell people about the coming of Christ. That's, remember the closed seal, the open seal? He wants it to remain open. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let whom who is vile, continue to do vile. Let him who does right continue to do right, and let him who is holy continue to do holy. So in other words, believers and unbelievers, just let them continue to do their thing, but you keep telling Jesus about the law and gospel, I mean, tell the people about the law and gospel, and that Jesus is their Savior and Lord, no matter who they are or what they are, no matter what their background is out. You witness to everybody. Then we have this whole section of what Jesus said. He says, Behold, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they have the right to be a tree of life, and may go through the gates of the city. And outside are the dogs. By the way, it's interesting. Who are the dogs? You remember when Jesus was sitting at the table and uh, there was this woman crying and, and uh, she said that even the dogs received the crumbs and uh, why did Jesus call her a dog? Because she was a canine night woman. Canine. Sorry. That's one of my bad jokes with my life. <laughs> But a dog is an unbeliever. That's an unbeliever. 
fact, the Muslims call Christian dog. So we don't believe in their prophet, their Messiah. Those who practice magic arts outside there are the dogs who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the adulterers, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Similar to chapter 21, said the same thing. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you the, the testimony for the churches, plural. So that's still true today. We are still to tell the message of Christ today. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright morning star. Now that's, he is the morning star. Not Satan, the morning star. He is the Savior, the Messiah, the morning star. Star of David. And then the spirit of the bride said, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. But now, there's a warning. Now this is the second time this verse was repeated in the Old Testament and said again in this particular book of Revelation. I warn you, everyone who hears these words of prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes a word away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share of the trees of life and the holy city which are described in this book. This is what I was talking to the Catholic priest about. Is when you people add all of these traditions and teachings of the Vatican, I said, you're breaking what God says. Don't do that. Don't add anything. Yes, absolutely, yes. And notice what it goes on. He who testifies of things says, yes, I'm coming soon. Amen, come Lord Jesus. And notice how God allows the book of comfort to end with this verse. This is my favorite verse in this whole chapter. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Talk about the book of comfort. What a way to end it with a blessing. Well, what does this all mean? Well, as you look at that one sheet, there's this river of life, which is a divine blessing. It's also about life. This is also bringing the conclusion of Jesus' second coming to take us all home someday. And then, nowhere in the entire Bible do we read the resurrection of bodies of believers first, and then the thousand years followed by the resurrection of unbelievers and the rest of the believers. That's just nowhere to be found. And as we went through the entire book of Revelation, it doesn't say that either. And we don't hear it in the prophets. We don't hear it from the apostles. Jesus didn't teach that either. So why are they teaching that? So we got to remember, what did Jesus say? My kingdom is not of this world. But then he closes in John chapter 18, verse 36. But now my kingdom is from another place. So here comes the fun part. Let me look this up. There's another sheet. You have a parallel of Genesis. We are going to have some fun. This freaked me out when our professor made reference to this, and I said, no way. And all of a sudden, when we went through the Revelation of Genesis, it just kind of went, this is awesome. So if you compare Genesis chapter 1 to 3 with Revelation 21 and 22, we're going to see what the first paradise was like and what the second paradise was like. And what does that mean? Well, here at the beginning, in Genesis 1, 1 to 21, we have this wonderful, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And we remember what heavens mean? There's three levels of heaven. It's what we see, this, the oxygen which we breathe in the sky. The second is the universe as we know it. And the third heaven is the dwelling place of God. And then notice what it says in Revelation 21. Let's read this together. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, 
For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. So here we have this reference of the two together. Yes? Yeah. So we got there's three levels of heaven right now. And in Revelation it says, And I saw a new heaven, a new earth, for the first heaven passed away. Which heaven passed away? So the the sky and universe will be no more. So now there's going to be just one. And the Revelation says this is the dwelling place, not places. So heaven and earth will be one in the same place. I'm kind of going, boy, how do I get my mind wrapped around that one? So instead of a heaven and earth, it's going to be one place in glory. So the, the understanding when John says, I, I saw a new heaven, new that's heaven. because he's never seen God's place. No. He couldn't see that. He got a description of it, but it was kind of cool. And I love how uh, God led John to write this stuff down for us to enjoy and really get to make goose pimples come out. One of the things that I want to share with you is uh, uh, what was created on the first day, and I freaked everybody, I did this to every church I served, and I made them dust off the Bibles, and now, how many of you have been to church where they have Bibles in it, but you can see how dusty they are? Well, this church that we went to, the new senior pastor that came, we are going to get the people, to, we had people opening up their Bibles during the sermon. Now here at our Savior, they put it right on the screen, that makes it convenient. But notice, let there be light. And this was the first day. So God created light on the first day. So here comes my question. What was created on the fourth day? Let's read this together. And God said that the lights expand to the heavens to separate the day from night. And let them be for the signs for the season, for the days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to the light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of heaven to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning on the fourth day. Now, this is the question I asked the congregation. Since God created the sun, moon, and stars on the fourth day, where'd the light come from on the first day? Yeah! That freaked out everybody. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, what is that? Because it's going back to Revelation. There is no sun, moon, and stars. We have the glory of God forever and ever. So I just love that. So, as we look at Genesis chapter 1, 14 to 19, can somebody read that? Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 to 19. I think we just did. Yes, we just did that. I just like to repeat myself. And the reason why that's important is that God created light. But I want to take you to the other side. And I want you to take a look at what it says here. Somebody read Revelation 21, 23 to 25. What does this remind you of? Alaska. 
If you live in Alaska, there's six months of total darkness and six months of total light. And as I was studying about uh, weather affects our attitude, doesn't it? What state has the highest level of uh, anxiety and attempts of suicide? Alaska. Can you imagine it being dark six months straight? I mean, this past week has been nothing but gray. Then I woke up this morning and went, Whoop! This, I felt so excited this morning. And so here comes this shining light. And so it, it's interesting that, does that mean, we, are we going to sleep at all in heaven? Why would we? So we're going to be awake 24-7? All eternity? The Bible doesn't say, huh? Won't be tired. Won't be tired. But it says it's a, it is a place of rest. I get that. There is going to be a banquet. That's my favorite part of heaven, the banquet. And then what else? This is why I wanted to describe heaven for you throughout the book of Revelation. And we have these wonderful glimpses, phrases of what heaven's going to be like. But uh, one of the things that I want to bring to your attention is when you look at Genesis chapter 3, it talks about the serpent. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree of the garden? So we see this mischievous Satan taking on the form of a serpent. And it's interesting, before uh, the fall, he was walking. This was a, the serpent had legs. It wasn't until after the fall where God cursed him and he had a travel on his belly. Well, what I like is when you go to the parallel of Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, let's read this together. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And this is why we have the parallel of God created hell for Satan and his evil angels. Now here we have a reference to the description in Revelation 21, 8. Now what does it mean to be separated from God? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Why did they do that? They were naked. How did they know they were naked? They ate of the fruit of good and evil. And uh, I thought it was kind of interesting where God wove together, took an animal, slaughtered it, and gave animal skins to Adam and Eve. That was the first animal sacrifice in the Genesis. How about that? Nobody ever put that together. And so, what's the opposite? Well, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, let's read this together. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. So in Genesis, they were cast out. In Revelation, we are now going to experience what Adam and Eve missed out on. We're going to see Adam and Eve, and we're going to see the Garden of Eden as it once was. And the doors will be open for us to enjoy. Okay, we read about the creation in the six days in Genesis. When did God create hell? We don't know. All Sometime before he created the world? We believe that that happened during the process of creation. We don't know. It doesn't tell us the when. Because we do know from the New Testament it describes how Satan and the angels were cast out. It says that the place then. And so the only thing that Bible scholars all throughout the world says 
We don't know, but it, during the time of creation. It might have been before creation. Somebody said maybe they fell before God started. I said, it doesn't say that either. It's one of those questions that will get answered when we get to heaven. But, you know, the, the when is really something you don't want to be distracted by too much. Well, here's the part that is interesting. In Genesis, after they, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, notice what happened, what God said. I will surely multiply your pain in childbirth. The pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of well, I, uh, eat of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it in the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and the dust you shall return. Ooh, where do we hear that? <laughs> Cemetery. Cemetery. And where else do we hear it? Good Friday. Dust you are, and the dust you shall return. Interesting. Now, if you ask any farmer, working the ground is a lot of hard work. Can you imagine doing that one row at a time between, behind an ox? Thank God, God created John Deere. That really helped a lot of us. But how many of you are good at growing things? In our house, we try to plant stuff outside, or it always, it just dies. And that's why we don't get, oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I hate to be at their house. I'm good at growing babies. Growing babies, there you go. Yeah, you know, it, we, we don't have plants inside or outside our house. They just don't plant long. And we're coming and going all the time, and so, uh, if you ever go by our house, everything around the house is all stone. That's it. But now we're having problems with spiders. The spiders like stone, so we have to have that treated every year from now on. So it says your, daughter, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. What is, does that mean you're just going to fight all the time? What does it mean? Your, your desire shall be for your husband. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband. In other words, he was supposed to be the head of his house and act like one, and he didn't when he ate the fruit of his wife. He's not blaming the wife, he's blaming Adam. You didn't make your stand when your wife tempted you. You're supposed to be the leader here. That's what that means. And he, he threw it away. That's how it's worded in the... Not how it's written, but it's... I believe so. Your desire shall be for your husband. But he shall your desire shall be contrary to your husband. Notice what that says there. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. In, in the when you have NIV, what does it say? Your desire shall be for your husband. Yes. He will rule over you. Right. Interesting. But I like to go to the New Testament where the Apostle Paul says, you know, wives, submit to your husbands. Now I had a woman, I've had three women out of 45 years say, I will not say that at my wedding. Obey your husband. And I said, well, what does that mean? So I always added the verse right before that, the Apostle Paul says to the wife and the husband, submit to one another. Now third, and then it says, wives, submit to your husbands. So she says, I'll say yes as long as you add that verse back in there. <laughs> but, but the husband is supposed to act like Jesus in the church. <coughs> he acts like Jesus does, who is the groom to the church. 
Exactly. Then the husband will treat his wife correctly, and she exactly. won't mind obeying him. And how many husbands have not honored that? Many. <laughs> yes. I mean, I have not always been like a Christian towards my wife. You just made me confess my sin in front of all these people. <laughs> but yeah, we're not, we're not perfect by any means. But submission is to be Christ-like. Didn't Christ become a servant? He did not, not come here to, to be served, but to serve. And that's how we are supposed to be, especially towards our spouses and our children. We serve one another. That's where the word pastor, you know what the word pastor, shepherd actually also means? Doormat. We're always supposed to be ready for service. And sometimes we feel like a doormat because of the difficulty of the call that God has called us to be as pastors. But here's the good news. <coughs> In Revelation chapter 22, it says the opposite. So Adam and Eve were cast out, but look what happens here. Read this together, Revelation 22, 3. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. Totally opposite. And this is the way it was supposed to be with Adam and Eve before the fall. But we get to enjoy this new experience, the new heaven and the new earth. Now, let's talk a little bit about this tree business. In Genesis chapter 3, then the Lord God said, Behold, a man has come like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest the reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. So because of sin, they were no, not allowed to even come near the tree of life. In fact, what did God put there to stop them from coming close to it? He had an angel with fiery swords there. But in heaven, let's read this together. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city. So God's offering us, when we get to go to heaven, we get to go to the tree of life and walk through that. And this is eternal life. So, we, so when a Christian dies, they go from life to eternal life. That's what that means. So it's life after life. And so this is why I'm so excited. Some of you have interviewed me the other day from our member of our church and pastorship, you know, why are you so looking forward to uh, being with the Lord? Is it because there's life. I mean, I'm not dying of cancer, I'm living with cancer. And then when I'm done with this life, I'm going to have a new life, eternal life. Why wouldn't I be excited? This is, you know, it's difficult, but not, not always easy. But, you know, now my wife and I are still arguing who's going first, because Sue says, I can go be, still go before you. And when she said that, I said, I'll kill you if you do that. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to be a fly on the wall of our house? Very yes, it's very entertaining. And this is what has really helped our marriage for 50 years. You know, Sue has never really told me why she married me. I don't know if she married me because she felt sorry for me, but she says, you're funny. You're always, you know, she always picks up the things that I say that are not, you know, that, that are hilarious, yes. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's a joy. And, we, and now she's really turning on the humor now of the time that we've got left for whatever that is. And I'm enjoying that. And so, this is what keeps our marriage together. You've got to have a sense of humor. How, who's the jokester in your How many of you wives are the jokesters in your family? How many of you husbands are the jokesters? And, you know, everybody's going like this. Yeah, yeah. That's our role. <laughs> oh, did you hear that? No. It's not humor, it's Christ that keeps your marriage. 
See the theologian I married? She keeps me correct. All the time. She does not write my sermon. In fact, one time, my wife came into the office, and it was 11.30 at night on a Saturday night, and I was asleep. And so she woke me up, and she said, what are you working on? I said, my sermon for tomorrow morning. She said, well, if you fell asleep in the middle of your sermon, you probably ought to be fell in the And I didn't preach that sermon. In fact, I walked into the pulpit with no script at all. And that was a Sunday. I said, well, that was the best sermon you ever preached, Pastor. Oh, I'm thinking, oh, man. Now, Genesis talks about how Adam and Eve lost their experience of having paradise. Let's read this together. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and the flaming sword and at every way to guard the way of the tree of life. When we go to heaven, it's the total opposite. If you are to look at Revelation chapter 22, verse 2, read this together. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river was a tree of life which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. For the leaves of the trees were the healing of the nations. We're going to get to experience that forever. And we will be blessed beyond compare. And we will be healed by the blood of the Lamb. So will there be a calendar in heaven? <laughs> there it is. There, yeah. No. Because there is no day, no night. It's eternity. So the time frames are going to be totally... We're going to live in eternity. That's odd. And it's not seven days a week anymore. It's suddenly just eternity. I'm thinking, how are we going to live that? That's going to be so cool. So Genesis says the tree of life. Here it says the tree's on either side of the river. Yep. And then it says each tree. Each, yeah. Notice. So is that two? Ah, does it say each? Maybe it's a full of tree of life. Of tree of life is, you know, that's, a, that's interesting. I never caught the word each before. One of the trees that grow in the swamp down south. Yeah. It's Maybe it's just going to be grown right out Yes. Yeah. Well, don't trees bear other seeds and then they bear other trees? So I'm thinking maybe the tree of life is it plural? I have to look that up. This is the first time somebody caught that. I'm like, ooh. So I'm still learning something. I, I'm going to have to look that up. Does anybody have a commentary where it explains that? Hey, mine does. Huh? Well, let me find out if it's in there. Revelation 22, verse 2. Let's see what the commentary says. It just says tree of life. <laughs> That's all it says. It doesn't explain it any further. But, the, but it says each tree, so there's going to be several. It'll be several, but it's still the same. It's like peaches. What's going to be in the peach orchard? Peach trees. So what's going to be in the tree of life? Tree of life. life trees. Trees of life. You know, that, that, I'm going to now you're gonna make me do Bible study at my house. Is <laughs> there? One of the things that helped me is that we sing a hymn where Jesus was crucified on the tree. So is the tree of life the empty cross? I'm wondering if that's it. And I can see the parallel of that very quickly, see? And I'm thinking, yeah, maybe the tree of life is the cross. 
empty cross, the victory over sin and death. I mean, I would like that. One of the verses in my, my study Bible refers to Ezekiel. And there it says, fruit trees of all time will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear, because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Ooh, so there's the scripture, interpreting scripture. Yeah, it's plural. Yes, thank you for that. That's the reference. I haven't read that in a long time. Yes, I wondered about that too. The 12, what do the 12 fruits mean? Huh? There it is, completeness. In other words, all the work of God is completed. We go to heaven. And uh, it's whole. And, uh, and it's something that we are all going to be able to enjoy. All right. 18 weeks. And I only missed four classes in those 18 weeks. So I'm thankful to God for the help. How many of you have found this to be enlightening and you know a little bit more about Revelation? Now, how many of you feel a bit more comfortable now, that since it is a book of comfort, that that has made a world of difference as you read Revelation? And has this helped you make a distinction between the two sides, evil and good, righteous and the unrighteous, the sheep and the goat? you have a better understanding about that? How many, have a, how, how many of you were surprised about how many verses in Revelation is a book of comfort? That was really powerful, especially the last two chapters. It gave very little to the unbelievers, but a lot of joy and anticipation for those of us that are anticipating eternity in heaven. That's so cool. What was the biggest surprise for you in the study of Revelation? What? Yes. I had, I had always in the past been led to believe that Revelation was a book to be afraid of. And that doesn't <coughs> seem to be the case. Exactly. Because now you see how Scripture interprets Scripture. You saw how the Old Testament and New Testament explain, especially how many of you were surprised that Jesus in the four Gospels explains the last day. Short, sweet, and simple. And by studying what Jesus said about the last days, it makes a big difference when you read Revelation and think what Jesus said this. A lot easier. What else was a surprise to you? What was uplifting for you as you read Revelation? What's that? There is so much, yes. Because every time I teach Revelation, I get excited. And every time I teach any book of the Bible, I get excited. But uh, it's just a good way to close. But now, I'm going to go back and study some more because I'm always learning something every time I do the study. I'm going to pick it up. Can I go off what he said? That, you know, it's, I always thought it was just and gloom and destruction for everyone. You yeah. Know? But being a Christian, there's there's a good yeah. good side of it. Yeah. And there's not that much said there's about it. Yeah. More is said about the believer than it does the unbelievers in Revelation. And for a long time I thought it was the opposite myself until I started studying the text. That's true. Others? Sir? Maybe one thing that makes it kind of effective is what what you're going through in your attitude in presenting it. I think that's that's comfort, knowing yep. that you're, you're experiencing what you're experiencing, and yet there's joy in what you see in the book. I think that's kind of a takeaway for me. Yeah. That, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be worried about the things that happen because the other side is worth waiting for. Exactly. It is. Others thoughts. 
So all of you are ready to teach the book of Revelation now? <laughs> I've had three pastors from uh, Madison County call me. They all have the entire sets of all the handouts. If you missed any of the handouts, uh, please check with Colleen, uh, or you can see me after the service. We have kept pages that you might have missed. And uh, uh, Bill and them, they, uh, they wanted a whole set from one of their friends that missed the whole thing. People that are watching online, they don't have those hands out. So let them know that they can call the church and Colleen will email all the lessons. It's also available email. So I did that as well. Anything else? Well. What's that? Yes. Uh, what do we count? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, fifteen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 18, 19, 20, 20. Yeah, we're, this is the average that we normally have. According to my understanding, we will meet again back in room 16. Because I told the staff it was my fault I misunderstood what you said about the microphone. It's not that you can't hear me, but you can't hear each other. And you're not in fellowship with each other. You're not facing each other like you did before. So we would like to have that room. And it will either be that room or next to it an open area. It will still be an enclosed area. But uh, the, the uh, junior high Sunday school is growing. And so I'm thinking, I don't want to take that room away. However, uh, we, they're, they're, they're going to have the same problem we have. We have like 44 was the maximum we've ever had in there. But uh, people like the table for fellowship, for having discussions, and, you know, so we'll probably, uh, it is looked for that we'll be in that room on J January the 7th. How many of you plan to be there? Okay. All of you want to turn Catholic after this class. Okay. <laughs> By the way, the word Catholic is a good word. It means universal. It means all Christians worldwide. So the word Catholic was almost during the time of the apostles, and that's what it meant. But what the problem that happened is 300 years later, the Rome started getting a bunch of priests and bishops getting together and saying, we need to organize this. And that's when they started to become a religious denomination called the Roman Catholic. And as of recent of 2007, Pope Benedict said that is, the Catholic Church is the only true Christian church. So I found that mentioned several times going back centuries from other popes. And so I've just, uh, it's only going to be four weeks, and there's going to be so much eye-opening information about what they teach. And I gave you the, uh, the quotes of where it comes from, when it was written, who wrote it. I got it all in there. And uh, uh, it's just really fascinating. And I, I'm still witnessing. Uh, people say, well, is the Catholic Church a Christian church? Sure. Now, they say that the Roman Catholic diocese, papacy, and pope are infallible. What does that mean? They don't make mistakes. And they say that they don't make mistakes. Is the church infallible? Yes. No, we have sinners everywhere. Yeah, the church is not perfect. But neither are the leaders. And so I found Bible verses, tons of them, proving did Peter and Paul always agree with each other? No. Remember the argument that happened between Paul and Barnabas? And, and uh, I don't want John Mark to come with me. He's, he's got weak shoes. He's afraid of sharing the gospel. He's too young. And so they're actually, church leaders didn't always agree. And uh, they also believe that Peter was the first pope. And actually, the apostles sent Peter out. So 
who is really the leaders. All of them together made up. And when the decisions were made, it was made by everybody, the church leaders and the lay people, sent people out with the gospel. So it's really kind of interesting. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we end this year with a wonderful ending of grace be with us all, peace be with us all. Be with us during this Christmas season that we can live Christmas and Easter every day of our lives with great joy. Grant your Holy Spirit among us as we lift up praises to you by sending your Son Jesus to be our newborn Savior and King. And we just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will continue to point us to Christ and all God's people say. Amen. Enjoy the next two weeks. See you back on the 7th over there.